All right, well, welcome everybody to our presentation today. Um, we are going to be, our guest speakers are going to be talking about uh, respiratory issues and ALS. And I will introduce them in just a minute, but just want to go through some housekeeping uh, just for a second. I know most of you guys are Zoom experts, so you understand all this, but um, the best view to view the presentation in is speaker view. And we'll spotlight the speaker so that um, you'll be seeing them on the screen. This presentation is being recorded. And so we will send the recording uh, to you all afterwards. Um, so you can view any content that you may want to go back and uh, look at again. And uh, also, if you guys will just keep yourselves on mute uh, just to minimize any background noise, that will help out a lot. One last thing, if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, you can use the chat feature at the, usually at the bottom of your screen. If you move your cursor around, you'll see the chat function pop up and you can enter any comments or questions in there. And we'll be monitoring the chat box and addressing questions and comments uh, throughout the presentation. So um, with that said, I wanna introduce our, our speakers today. And uh, we have Toya and we have Daniel and they're from Pulmonary Plus and they have a respiratory company up in the Dallas area. But they're going to be talking about uh, their company, but also respiratory issues um, in ALS and uh, we'll be fielding some questions at the same time. So, all right, I will pass it off to you guys. Hello, thank y'all so much for joining us today. So my name is Toya Simmons and I am one of the respiratory therapists here at Pulmonary Prevention Plus. And like Steve said, we are in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, so we cover the Metroplex Dallas-Fort Worth, but we also go out about two and a half to possibly three hours outside of the Metroplex. But something that makes us a little different is number one, we are all respiratory therapists. So anytime anyone has a call or needs a setup or needs to be seen, it will always be by a respiratory therapist. Um, and what we specialize in is the ventilators and the BiPAP machines just to help with the breathing. Um, so that's something that we do here. We take pride in just really understanding all of the uh, equipment that's out there. We like to assess each and every patient to figure out what machine works best for them. And every single patient has our direct cell phone numbers, okay? So if anybody ever has any problems, then you can call us directly. Um, but I just wanted to kind of give that brief introduction. So again, I am one of the respiratory therapists here. And then I want to go ahead and turn that over to Daniel, who is our intake coordinator. So he handles everything when it comes to intake for all the patients. And he will be talking to you more in depth on the clinical side, okay? But thank y'all so much for joining us. <laughs> and here's Daniel. All right. How are you guys doing today? Doing good. All right. So um, my idea for our conversation today uh, is, is just to, is just that I'll go through what I would say is like a mock um, progression of what we see in dealing in with we see patients deal with and what we try to help patients overcome in the progression of ALS and neuromuscular disease uh, in particular. And in that progression, uh, I will touch on different points, uh, different things that, that may be able to uh, keep an eye out for, uh, different things to, uh, to be thoughtful of. Uh, and then at any given time, if you guys have any suggestions or questions or uh, thoughts that you guys want to share, feel free to uh, just let me know. And then we can have a dialogue, a dialogue about it right then and there. I don't want you to wait too long and forget uh, your questions because every, every question is important. And, uh, and we do value them. So uh, that being said, uh, essentially on intake, obviously you have, uh, we'll start with the patient being diagnosed with ALS. Now, uh, diagnoses in, in different patient situations present, I guess you would say similar challenges, but those similar challenges may affect us in different ways based on our home dynamic, uh, based on our, uh, you know, different, um, situations that may not necessarily be clinical, but just be life uh, circumstance in general. Uh, but 
with this mock patient scenario, a patient is diagnosed with ALS, and then you have obviously two different um, starts of progression. Uh, just to simplify, you may have where it starts where patient is, has issues with swallowing, uh, eating, and things of the sort starting um, there or with the mouth, or you may have where it's starting from the limbs. Uh, and so in that, there's different things to start trying to be accommodating for uh, and to uh, keep an eye out for and to start thinking about in the actual uh, treatment plan for you, right? And so uh, what is commonplace is that you go, you get your, you'll have your diagnosis and then the, you will have an assessment with, with, with our patients, we'll do an assessment with them. Now, one thing to remember in, in assessing or being assessed is that you'll go to your doctor's office or, or whatever clinical facility where you're receiving your treatment at, but there may be a gap in, in whether it's the communication from you know, patient to doctor or clinical staff or clinical staff to the patient uh, where it comes to actual circumstance at home. And so one thing I always want you guys to keep in mind is to be as open and as truthful uh, with the clinical staff and with yourself as possible to create a good solid foundation for a treatment plan uh, over the course of the disease state. Uh, because you don't want to start off on a on faulty ground with um, with the clinical staff and the patient, you as a patient or someone as a patient uh, being on two different pages and there becomes, and it creates more obstacles in the care plan, okay? And so one thing that we offer and that we try to make sure that we're doing here is bridging the gap or, or there I say be a go between between the, the, the two entities, whether it's the patient uh, in, the, in the clinical staff. And the reason why that's important is because as a patient, you may convey or communicate something to the doctors um, or to the clinical staff that you think they have a good grasp of, but you know, obviously, nine times out of 10, they haven't actually seen your living conditions. And it can be something as small as your bathroom is on, a, you live in a, a town home, your bathroom is on the second floor, or your main living area is on the second floor, and your ALS progression starts at your limbs. So now you going up and down stairs creates a different challenge, whereas someone with the same uh, uh, progression starting from their limbs has a one-story home, and in their main living area, bedroom, so forth and so on, kitchen, uh, bathroom, it's all on one floor. And so these are things where you have to start and say, okay, hey, do we need to start making um, a change in our, lim in our living accommodations? Even before you get to the actual clinical disease state process, uh, this is something that's very important because what that starts to do is set a foundation for you to have a better quality of life from jump. Uh, if you're struggling to do something as simple as go um, go to your bedroom where you want to take a nap, but you have to go up a, a flight or a flight or two of stairs, um, let's say if someone lives in an apartment, you have to go upstairs and things like that, then now, you know, there needs to be arrangements made to accommodate for this, what would seem like to be a, a, a small obstacle, but becomes a very huge uh, deterrent in day-to-day -day living, right? So that's something to keep in mind. And as, uh, as well as if you're not able uh, to use or have, some people may have a shower to where they can just walk right into the shower, or you may have a shower to where you have to step over into the tub, right? And so little things like that, that when we're coming out as clinicians, we're trying to assess the, how, how realistic or how practical it is or the ease um, that you can continue to have, I guess you would say, in your day-to-day -day living, right? And so I want you to keep those certain things in mind uh, or little things such as, as you look forward or look towards, I guess you would say the, the, the at some point, the next steps or, ne or the progressions of the disease, what do, you, what do you want that to look like? You know, or what are you okay with? What are you not okay with? These are things that you wanna make sure that you're having communications with, with the clinical staff. And you may say, well, how does that fall into the realm of respiratory issues? Well. As, as things go forward, you know, if you're a patient and, you're, and your disease state starts from your limbs, the respiratory issues may not necessarily come as fast, right? Whereas as if it's starting from your mouth, your throat, 
swallowing, things of that sort where you can't protect your airways. Now there's that, that, that progression, although it all kind of ends in the same, uh, at the same destination, the progression is slightly different. So you have to know what you're okay with, what you're not okay with, and, and, and from a, even from a mental perspective, so what you want to set a course for for your, for your life, right, in your, in your care plan. And so let's say that uh, you have an issue where it started from the swallowing effect. So when, the, when you come out, you definitely want to do uh, little things like uh, if you can't protect the airway and, and being able to swallow is one of those tell or not swallow is one of those telltale signs of being able to protect your airway and how they may affect little things such as do we start on a, a BiPAP or do we start on whatever uh, intervention respiratory wise uh, to where uh, we can try to overcome these things. Um, obviously, from a mental standpoint, if you need a CPAP for example, uh, because if you're not able to protect your airway while you sleep, that's going to interrupt your sleep. So we're looking at quality of life because if you're tired on top of having, you know, whatever neuromuscular uh, state, the neuromuscular stage that you're at, but you're just in general, just tired, that's going to compound things that not, not necessarily that the, uh, the ALS or the neuromuscular prognosis is doing itself, but it's because it's not being accommodated for, it's compounding. So you want to think about that versus, let's say if it starts at your limbs and now you're having an issue of not being able to cook for yourself, right? And so if you can't cook for yourself, being that you're not, you're not able to handle pots, pans, et cetera, now that can create because of maybe a malnutrition starts to set in because of lack of eating, so forth and so on, that starts to create some physical deconditioning that's not necessarily a direct cause of ALS, but it's an indirect uh, consequence of having ALS. So in both scenarios, what you have is an inability to keep your physical strength up and based on ALS, but for two different, from two different starting points, right? And so it's important that, you know, Going back to the example of your, your kitchen being on the second floor, if you can't get to your kitchen with ease, then what do people tend to do? They tend to snack in the, in the area where they're at. And so you become more malnutrition or you're not getting a proper nu uh, nutrition or nutritional diet because you're just eating chips maybe all day or whatever it is that we decide that we, that we want to indulge in at, at the time, right? Uh, but these little things, these little components are things to think of as we are, are, are taking into account the value that we're trying to add with uh, dealing with this disease state, right? So going into a CPAP or a BiPAP, generally that is the next step when you're talking about respiratory issues, you, you get to a point where the doctor or the clinical team uh, starts to recognize that you're not able to, you're starting to have more difficulty, should I say, breathing, whether that's uh, while you're sleeping only or, or while you're awake as well. Uh, one thing I, I would want to bring to you guys' attention to consider as well, and I don't think it's as re readily used in, with ALS patients as it maybe could be, is incorporating something uh, known as high flow therapy. And that's not necessarily with oxygen. Obviously, we don't want to, we, we don't want to use oxygen with ALS, um, but high flow therapy can what it does is it provides an extra flow that's more comfortable and more compatible to daily use. And the reason why that's important, we have we actually have an ALS patient here in Dallas to where you know he uses his NIV at nighttime, but because he was needing some support in the daytime, he was using nasal pillows to accommodate for his breathing in the daytime for his respiratory insufficiency. And one thing that uh, we're discussing with the team right now is that why are you wearing, even if it's a BiPAP, right, uh, which is considered a nighttime device and an NIV being a non-invasive ventilator is considered a daytime and a nighttime device. Why are you wearing these interfaces to, to receive the therapy from those devices? You're not able to eat, drink, or speak, right? Not, not conveniently speak anyway, right? And what that does to you is that really starts to take a toll on your quality, on your quality of life. And so you, those, these are things you want to keep in mind is that, hey, if I can't communicate effectively, if I have to make a decision between breathing or eating, right, because I need this extra flow and support to be able to overcome my respiratory effort, 
but in the same breath, I can't even take a sip of tea because you may be a person really like, like, you know, I grew up drinking very, very sweet tea, obviously being in Texas. <laughs> I grew up drinking uh, tea. So if, if it's not something, and these are little things, right? I, I, Ernest said, yes, I, he, say, he seconds that. Um, if, I, if you grow up in those little things, those little things really matter, especially as we start to lose our faculties um, and because of the progression of disease, uh, you want to be able to hold on to whatever you can. So adding something like a high flow therapy, and there are different devices that, that do provide this, uh, whether it's the Airvo 2 at home is a device, uh, an another device known as the V-Pro ventilator, where it, it can provide uh, high flow therapy in, in non-invasive uh, therapy, ventilation therapy. There's another device known as the Louisa ventilator that can do high flow therapy and non-invasive ventilator uh, therapy. And the reason why that's important is because now you're accommodating for daytime, quality of life, overcoming respiratory insufficiency, and then receiving that traditional therapy at night to actually help the diaphragm ex expand fully with, with, uh, with volume calculated, pressure support, so forth and so on. So that's one thing if you're, if you're um, uh, needing support in the daytime, because obviously everyone's at different progressions in their, in their status. In the, of their disease, but if you're needing, or you're starting to find, should I say, that you're needing a little bit more support and help in the daytime, ask your doctors about high flow therapy. It's not necessarily, people do use oxygen with it, but I don't want in your case, or in this case of neuromuscular disease, and ALS, I don't want you to confuse high flow therapy uh, with oxygen therapy. I am I'm specifically speaking to uh, a flow of, of air that's separate from oxygen that would, can help you overcome uh, uh, your work of breathing so that you can do the simple things like eat, drink, and speak effectively, right? The, the three things that we all want to do every day uh, in, 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 that's very involved in day-to-day -day living, right? Daniel, quick so, question. Sure. Uh, quick question, Daniel. Uh, the high flow therapy, is that just a different setting on the BiPAP or is that is that what that is? So yeah, so well, okay. So the high flow, you can with the Airvo, the high the high flow is it's a, a high flow device itself. So the Airvo two is a high flow device. The Louisa and the um, and the V Pro are actual. They're, they're not BiPAP. They're ventilators because they know a lot. I know a lot of practitioners will use the BiPAP first, right? But in that, if you're needing, uh, generally speaking, at least here, especially like with the uh, UT Southwest and everything, they tend to, if you're needing daytime support as well, they tend to go ahead and put you on a ventilator anyway. So yes, in, in that case, it's just another setting within the ventilator. So you all you're doing, your, your clinical team, a DME or the clinic, depending on how it's set up, will come out, assess your breathing, right? Sometimes that can be, uh, assess with post oximetry. Not, with ALS, that's not necessarily the case all the time. It's more subjective. How do you feel uh, in, in regards to the high flow therapy setup? Uh, but in that, we come out, we'll set the, uh, you know, do the evaluation in your home because the setup, even let's say you, you order ventilator A, who has a high flow and a, a NIV traditional therapy, the setup in the home may vary depending on your home. And so what do I mean by that? Let's say if you're still able to walk effectively, well, then we still want you to be able to get up and move around. So then we may need to set up a, 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 a pole or a stand, or if you're using a walker, come in, incorporate a walker, or if you're using a wheelchair, incorporate the setup with the wheelchair so that based on your, your, your how, how much you're using in the daytime, nighttime, however, that you're being accommodated for throughout the day versus someone who, you know, they, they're, they're really not moving around too much. They're just sitting in one place, maybe in their bedroom, maybe in the living room where it's kind of been um, uh, uh, updated to accommodate their, their, their needs. You may just sit it in one spot, right? So we definitely want to make sure, that's why the home eval is really important for your DME and for your the clinical team to come out and actually see your living area. Uh, and I would implore that that's what happens even prior to setup so that we can uh, that it can be accommodated for whatever your day-to-day -day, uh, needs are is accommodated for. And so, yes, it would just be a, a, a program one setting, a program two setting, 
and that's it. So now you're accommodated all day. Uh, another thing I will say, kind of, I guess, taking a step back into the BiPAP world, uh, BiPAP realm. When, if you're just needing support at night and your clinical team and your doctor just says, hey, we need support at night. One thing I want you to keep in mind is that uh, there are, there's a difference between generally uh, ALS and neuromuscular patients will get a BiPAP ST, uh, meaning spontaneous and time uh, backup support. I want you to keep in mind there is a, within that BiPAP ST uh, family, I guess you would say, or, or range, there is an added feature that your DME provider can give you, and it's called a, S, a BiPAP STA. And what that means is we can guarantee tidal volume within the, within the realm of a BiPAP. And one may ask, well, why is that important? That's important because in general, uh, BiPAPs will accommodate and adjust for your upper airway or sleep apnea or apneic um, um, deficiencies. And with ALS, yes, we want to accommodate the apneas and things of that sort, the upper airway obstructions and things of that sort. But we also want to make sure that we're getting adequate tidal volume to make sure you're getting that proper lung expansion. And that if you're not, that in the moment, the machine is making the, the necessary adjustments. So if the, if the doctor is, you know, is wanting you to get, you know, a, a volume of 600 and you're not getting that volume of 600 or 700 or 800 or 1,000 even, then we want to make sure that we're setting that in the BiPAP ST and that it's accommodating for it right then and there. And it's not so much after re, a reactionary thought process. So not being, oh, you haven't been reaching your volumes for two months. And then you go into the doctor's office, they see your download. And now it's like, well, let's raise your pressures. Well, now you've gone two months without hitting your volumes. And so we want to make sure that in the moment we're, we're flexible and that we're uh, being accommodating throughout the progression. Uh, because obviously, as we know, things with ALS can change or neuromuscular can change overnight. And we want to make sure that you're being accommodated for in that. Another thing that I will say briefly about BiPAPs that I would consider to be an advantage over maybe a, a non-invasive ventilator is that with the BiPAPs, uh, because of the nature of, of, of the device or the level of device that it is, you're able to make, the, the practitioners are able to make the adjustments remotely. So let's say that you are a patient who lives in a rural area and it's really hard to get into the clinic. And um, you may say, well, the clinic may say, well, we really want to guarantee the tidal volumes. And traditionally in that, you, they will order a ventilator. But with a ventilator, even if we're able to see your volumes remotely, um, you're not, the clinic themselves are not able to make any adjustments to those pressures remotely to be able to get, to, to make that adjustment on on, on the site, they will have to call the DME company. The, the, the DME company then will have a response time depending on the DME company, depending on where you live, depending on what their schedule was. And you can go a day or two, a week or two without, until it's actually adjusted because then they will have to write an order, this, that, and the third. Whereas if you had a BiPAP STA that was set up by the DME company, the clinic obviously would have uh, access to it. They would see it. Right then and there, they say, hey, we got to get more volume. We got to get more volumes for patient A. They would up your pressures right then and there on the spot. And when you went to sleep that night, it would adjust, right? And so those little things, that, 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 re, that, that preventative um, um, outlook, that being able to, as I say, call it audible in the moment, goes a long way with effective uh, care planning, right? Not necessarily, I've been feeling bad for X amount of time. What are we going to do about it, right? Because then you know if the BiPAP STA in this particular example, if it can't adjust for your breathing, then we know, hey, we need to look at uh, a non invasive ventilation. Another thing that I want patients to be aware of um, is actual accessory setup with your devices. So we spoke about the high flow therapy. And with the high flow therapy, I want you always to remember as well to, that you would need to add humidity with that. And that's just a comfort measure. I don't want you guys to uh, necessarily be on the high flow therapy and it's just drying you out. So that's just kind of like a, put an, uh, I guess, a pin in that and kind of um, think about that. But that aside, I want you guys to think about 
what we would consider active circuits in, in applying that to your treatment. And you say, well, what do you mean, Daniel? In that, traditionally, what we have with home, a non-invasive ventilation setup is that we have passive circuits. Passive circuits just means that there's, a, a, there's an expected leak in the circuit. And so uh, the patient and, and the machines in that always has a, a certain amount of continuous air blowing in the circuit. So that in that, you, the patient would have to pull past that continuous air, which in this particular case with neuromuscular, you, it, it can create a, 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 an added work of breathing, right? To where you're not able to accommodate for um, that, that, that stress that's put on the effort because you're always having to pull past that air and it's not as trigger sensitive to uh, respiratory insufficiencies. When you're adding an active circuit, so you say, well, Daniel, what's, what's the difference with an active circuit? The active circuit has a pressure line added to it, and it uses what's called a non, you have to use it, what's called a non-vented mask to where all of the leak that may occur or that will occur, the exhalation that will occur is at a different, usually at the, uh, at the, at the back, it's not at the patient interface, it's at the, more towards the actual vent itself. But what it would do is it would allow for the triggering to be more effective, right? And in that more effective triggering, you're not causing more stress on the patient. And so one thing, a lot of times what happens is a patient will say, hey, I'm coming, I'm, I'm going into the doctor's office and I'm, I'm, um, I feel like it's harder to pull the air in. And obviously that is, that is something that happens within a progression of neuromuscular disease. But in that, it may not be that you need more pressure uh, because a lot of times what you will see is that the doctors, you will still be getting your volumes, but it'll take a longer time to get your volumes, right? Especially if you're on particular like different settings that, that gives you that flexibility. It'll take a longer time to get your volumes. Where if it's taking a longer time to get your volumes, that means you don't have as much time to effectively and, and um, to blow out or to comp at a comfortable rate, blow out carbon dioxide, um, uh, in your in your breathing pattern, I guess you would say to try to simplify. So little things like using an active circuit that's going to make the triggering more effective can go a long way in the in how comfortable these devices are. Because a lot of times what you will see is, you know, because the devices aren't comfortable because of little things like triggering, patients will get discouraged from using it and they'll just they just won't use it as much and then their their treatment plan suffers because of it so that is something i want you guys to keep in mind is that you know there are different setups there are different accessories that can be applied even to the same device there are different devices within i guess you would say the same therapy family so where one de we've seen where one device you know that on the same settings works better for another device and vice versa, depending on the patient scenario. And so, for example, going back to the example where you have patients who may have issues in their progression started with their limbs first, and you start to lose that strength in your hands and not being able to effectively even do little things like pressing buttons, right? A lot of the manufacturers will have uh, screen touch uh, devices. And the screen touch devices it seem to be a little bit harder for, for patients with um, uh, neuromuscular disease, especially with losing strength in their hands to operate because sometimes the touch screen loses its um, effectiveness, I guess you would say. So you have to press a little bit harder, hold a little bit harder, your, your finger, uh, your hands begin to slide on the screen a little bit. So it just gets harder to use. So if you're using a device like that, you know, there are other devices that still do use push buttons. And, uh, and so you may want to ask your doctor, it may be something as simple as that. But I guess the theme that I'm trying to get across in this particular segment of my, of my talk is that the little things add up, especially with neuromuscular disease. And I want you guys to kind of be proactive in, in being like, okay, this is a little thing, but there, there can be another way to address it. Does anybody have so far have any questions for me? <laughs> I have one question. Um, obviously, you guys have access to different devices, mm -hmm. uh, different bypass, different ventilators. Um, 
what's kind of your number one priority when you are assessing a patient and determining which device would be the most appropriate for them? Uh, because a lot of a lot of new people to the respiratory world, they don't have a clue, so they're just going to go with what the doctor's recommendation is or the respiratory therapist's recommendation is. And so what is kind of your priority when you're determining which device is most appropriate for a person? So first and foremost, it, it may sound weird, but uh, the clinical, I guess you would say the clinical um, aspect is not so much the first priority. The first priority would be the, the, the ease of use, right? So for example, I can set up a device that may be clinically the, from the heavens and does everything that anyone can ever imagine, but if a patient can't use it, it doesn't really, doesn't really matter, right? So the first thing I'm, that we're doing when we're going out is that we're, in a sense, we bring the device, we, we try to bring more than one device, especially if the doctor's giving us that autonomy. And we, we have like an open dialogue with you, with the patient and say, hey, tell us your day-to-day -day schedule. What are, you, what, are you, what are you most concerned about? What do you think your issues are? And, and actually see them operate and touch the devices and try to go with the first device that's the easiest to use for them. From there, then we try to make sure that it's clinically, I say that, you know, like the clinical use is easiest. And I say, well, what do you mean by that, Daniel? There are certain devices, the, uh, different manufacturers will highlight different features that, um, that will allow them in their mind and the manufacturer's mind to have an advantage over each other. And so, for example, let's say we have a patient who has neuromuscular disease, but also has, actually has lung, like actual lung issues, not just neuromuscular issues, but has lung issues. Well, now you have to accommodate um, if they have, like I've had a patient in the past who had COPD and who also had uh, neuromuscular ALS. Well, you can't just necessarily blow up a person just because they have neuromuscular. You can't just give them the, these big volumes because it, it's going to cause air trapping with the, with the COPD, right? And then on top of that, this particular patient had OSA, like actual OSA before getting the ALS. So then we would, we use, we would use something like the Astro. So we're going to make sure that we're accommodating for the, a, the, uh, the, the OSA because it will actually show us the AHI in the, in the reporting where the other machine, the other download reports don't give us that. It's kind of more like guesswork, I guess you would say. And then from there you say, okay, they have OSA. We're going to use this device because it addresses the OSA. But then it also will address the, uh, the, CO, the COPD aspect of with the certain mode like IVAPs to where the areola ventilation and like dead space and things like that has been, are, are being accommodated for. But then it's also going to allow for us to look at um, different, other different things and, and, and assess other volumes and other rest like RSBI, all these other things that actually look at the, ven the ventilation that we need to look at for ALS. But let's say it covered all those things, but with the astral, because it's a touchscreen, the patient couldn't operate it because it's touchscreen. Now all those things go out the window. So we can have, it still is a very much so catered, tailored thing per patient. Cause it's, that's why it's really hard to say, well, I'd rather go with this device versus that device. But I will say this, a lot of ALS patients obviously use their devices, they travel with their devices, going to doctor's visits, going here maybe to a family event, so forth and so on. And from there, what, I, what I've come to understand is that there is a machine called the Vivo 45 that's only five pounds, right? So now you go from, you know, like your, your trilogies and some in your Vivo 50s and 65s, uh, they're 11 pounds. So now you think about someone putting these devices and carrying these devices all over the city, five pounds, that five pound difference makes, makes the world of difference, right? So those are the little things that, you know, uh, we try to make sure that we're communicating and have an open lines of communication. Because when we go out for the initial assessment, someone may not care much about it because they're strong enough to carry machines that are heavier. But then a month later, that changes. And so those are things that, you know, we want to make sure that you're continuing the, the lines of communication with the different, um, in, during the different stages with your providers. Uh, that was a long way of answering that, Steve. I'm sorry, but... <laughs>
No, nah, that was perfect. Um, one thing I was I think is interesting too is because <clears throat> sometimes we get siloed into thinking, oh, I'm having respiratory issues, so I need I need a BiVAP or non-invasive ventilator, whatever it may be, and that'll solve everything. Mm -hmm. But one thing you pointed out early on is that you've got to look at the whole picture. And you've got to look at kind of the home environment, like how you move around, um, you know, because there's a lot of things that affect respiratory function. And mm -hmm. the ventilator in and of itself is not going to be the 100%, you mm -hmm. know, solution to it. There's other things like conserving your energy and making sure that you schedule, you know, more vigorous activities when you have a higher level of energy and there's, there's lots of things that they tell you at clinic, especially PT and OT, uh, to conserve your energy. Sit down while you're taking a shower. And so, but I'm saying all those activities affect the respiratory component too. So I'm glad you pointed that out early on because it's, it's, a, it's bigger than right. just breathing in and out. So, right, right. And exactly. And just to piggyback off of that, that's why I brought up the nutrition aspect of it. Um, because that's probably just for respiratory patients in general. That's probably the biggest obstacle because when you when you're having issues breathing, if you know when you're swallowing, you're not breathing, right? When we're talking, technically we're not breathing because you have to take a breath and then we let out a lot of air, which I seem to have at times. So, so that being said, you know you do want to understand that this may sound awkward, but you almost have to treat your body like a fine-tuned athlete in a sense because your respiratory function isn't obviously quote unquote normal. So you wanna make sure that you're feeding your body the nutrition that it needs to recover day in and day out from that, that extra work of breathing. And so for some patients, I explain to them because it's so taxing on them to walk across the room, I would tell them your walking is like my running. Your sitting is like my walking. Just to give them the illustration and how much it's, it really is taxing and really putting stress on their body. So you have to really, in the, in the overall broad scope of things, make sure that you're, that you um, are treating your body and your mind, right? Because if you get into a, a mental space to where you get discouraged, then that throws a lot of your treatment plan out, the, out of the window too. So we wanna make sure that we're being practical in what we're doing, that, we're, that we always, always and always include the quality of life component but we also want to make sure that in that we're not we're not sacrificing too much of the clinical treatment plan that needs to be in place to make sure that you're getting the effective care so um that's one thing um so any any other questions in regards to that but and i'll just touch on a couple more things and i'll just open up for dialogue if that's okay yeah, and just a reminder, if you guys want to use the chat, feel free to enter questions or comments in the chat bar uh, if you have any. So one thing that I think that you just said was um, sparked kind of this thought of a lot of times when we're progressing, our body naturally compensates, right, for, for these deficits. Mm -hmm. And so we may not necessarily know that changes are happening, um, until we look back as to kind of what's our normal baseline. Um, mm -hmm. But that kind of run-walk analogy was interesting because, yeah, people naturally compensate. They don't even realize it. They're compensating mm -hmm. by using other muscles right. that they don't normally use, like all their trunk muscles that normally they don't, they don't use all of those to get a breath in, mm -hmm. but now they have to because of some of the weakness that's happening. And so I think that's a good point that you made on that. So, yeah. but. Any other questions, feel free to put those in the chat or if you want to unmute and ask a question. Uh, Kathy has one. What number do I call for an appointment? Are you talking about with Pulmonary Plus? Or with are you Daniel. Talking oh. With Daniel? No. Oh, well, you, you can, I can give you the number. Are you in Dallas or close? Well, we actually live in Midlothian. Closer oh, to okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Closer That's to cool. O'Villa. We're on the north side. South Cedar yep. Hill. Yeah, I can give you. I'll give you my number. Our because all our numbers. That's what like I, like Toya was pointing out earlier. You can, you can call us directly anytime you want to. It's always a therapist. We're always here for you. Sometimes people even text us, so forth, so on. So my my number is. I can tell you right here now. It's four six nine, uh, four six nine three seven one, four nine 
one zero. And that's one thing to remember too, guys. Try to try, I don't I, I can't speak for other DME companies and companies, but I, you, you would like to have a, a go to person, even though obviously you can't always get the same person, but you want to have a personal relationship with someone in the company um, that you're getting your services from, that a consistency, because you know, sometimes, like Steve was saying, we normalize decline. And someone who's consistently seeing you, who's coming out month after month for, you know, whatever, they may notice something that you didn't even realize was happening, right? I, I guess I would use like the weight analogy, like someone uh, who's losing weight, you know, they may have lost 10 pounds, but they didn't see it because they're seeing themselves every day in the mirror. And because you're seeing yourself every day in the mirror, you don't necessarily see the weight loss. And then someone who hasn't seen you in, you know, a certain amount of time, he's like, oh my God, you lost X amount of weight. It's the same thing. We 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 overcome things slowly. It's like the the, the boiling pot that's sl that's slowly going up, right? And you normalize the temp or the temperature. And uh, we don't want we don't we want to make sure that we're trying to keep some consistency in your care plan. With and that's the people who take care of you is involved in that. So, but thank you. Any other? Yeah. Uh, Let's see, there's a comment not, in the chat. Yeah, uh, Karen says it's very difficult when you live in a rural area west of I-35 to locate people with knowledge of ALS. It'd be beneficial to ALS patients and also your company to go out and train home health and hospice agencies. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, there's something if you you know, I would say this: we're always open, even if I, we've done this in the past for other like uh, uh, patient diagnoses. If it's an issue to where that's not, they're not even our patients, but as long as obviously we get like the clear from like for HIPAA and stuff like that, you want us to talk to someone, we don't have any issues doing that. Like we've spoken and, and help people, even though we don't service Arkansas, we help people in Arkansas, Louisiana, uh, because they're, they're, their providers or their home providers may not have, I guess you would say the, the, the experience to pull on to service different situations. And so we don't have any issue. We're, we're literally here to try to raise the standard of DME and the clinical application of DME and the providers um, for, you, for anyone who's looking to be helped. And so feel free, uh, I gave my number out earlier, feel free if you have a hospice home health that you want us to speak with, we would love to. We do have, we've had experience with hospice and, and home health and, and uh, work with patients depending on what the scenario is and everything. So that's something that is something that we do, so. And Kathy asked a good question. What does DME stand for? Oh, I'm sorry, Durable Medical uh, Equipment. Yeah. That's what it stands for. Uh, yeah, one of the big challenges respiratory wise and just in this whole medical equipment world is learning the jargon and learning kind of what, because yeah. there's a different language that's being used. Um, and there's a lot of terms that are being thrown out there. And so um, it's almost like learning a new language. Um, yeah. Trying so, to so yeah, that's what it means. And, and let me say, the goal isn't in, in traditionally in the DME or durable medical equipment world is the, the companies were just, you know, it was standard just to deliver the equipment and kind of sign off on it. This is how you use it and kind of go. And that's just not, I think that definitely, I know that needs to be updated. Um, ideally, the things that, you know, I used to, I came out of the, the, the inpatient world. And the way that I used to think about care and what I thought was uh, applicable for someone while I was in the hospital servicing them versus what they're doing at home is two, to is two totally different worlds. You know, so I do want to make sure that, that you guys understand that and make sure that um, that the people that are servicing your home equipment are knowledgeable and they're not just dropping it off and saying good luck. <laughs> so, yeah. That's what they're doing. They're mailing it to you and saying good luck. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, to hear that. I know. Yeah. I'll call you. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer, I promise. <laughs> um, and Karen says, uh, half of our hospice agencies did not support the trilogy, and those that did didn't know anything about it. So yeah, I think, there's a big gap yeah. in education there. So, so 
let me kind of yeah, and I'm gonna touch on that in regards to them supporting the trilogy and and their their knowledge of it. Traditionally, the trilogy has been treated like a BIPAP. They put they kind of set it and forget it in a sense. And so there wasn't enough emphasis put on what setting to use, why to use that setting, when the settings may need to be adjusted, so forth and so on. And not to get overly clinical about it, but what I will say is that even in hospice or when you're even considering hospice, one thing to, to keep in mind is that I, sometimes the treatment plan in hospice and prior um, may look a lot different if you if you're using some of those things that I talked I touched on earlier, like the the proper accessories, um, taking into account home life balance uh, in regards to where do you stay at in the house majority of the time, because those things do impact the decision to go to hospice at a particular time. Because you may say, I don't want to have to choose to eat or breathe, so I'll just rather just go to hospice versus maybe the high flow cannula can be effective. And so now you're being compensated for your breathing, but you're still able to eat and drink and speak and, and communicate effectively. So you may not choose that route at the time that you choose it. Not to say that that won't be something that's down the line, but that may add to the time of quality of life that you, that you mentally are able to uh, be satisfied with. And so that's why it goes back to the original point, setting the foundation for what you want your care to look like and what is or is not there to accommodate your care is important to, because it will affect even the end decisions. So, a couple of more questions. Um, do you have a connection in the Houston area? That's one a, question. So. A connection for a DME or a connection for a doctor? Assuming a DME. No, no, not a DME. Um, no, 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 no one that I would, I would say this, no one that I would put my name on. <laughs> Well, that's just me okay. being honest. All right. Yeah. And uh, George asked, how the best way to use, what's the best way to use a uh, Phillips Respironics cough assist to expand the lungs? Mm. Okay. That's so probably that very is, involved, isn't it? <laughs> uh, okay. So there, I'm, I'm going to answer that in two different parts. Okay. The first part is if you're, if you're using just the cough assist, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're objectively getting the, the volumes that you need to generate, whether it's a cough or just like the, just the inspiratory lung hyperinflation treatment, also known as like IPPV treatment. You want to make sure that you get enough volume. So it doesn't, you know, some of the synchrony or some of the, you know, putting in a manual, a manual mode or auto mode or, or et cetera won't matter as much if you're not getting the volume you need to, to get the therapy you need. That being said, uh, generally speaking, um, that then also depends on when you're getting your treatment, is someone helping you with that treatment? So is someone holding a, a mask to your face? Is some, are you able to put your mouth around a, a mouthpiece? Like these things are things effectively, not just it's there, but effectively getting that feedback. And if you need cough assist, well, are you 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 got you have to use a mask. You can't just use like um, you can't just use a, a a mouthpiece. Or if you're on a ventilator and you're trait and you're getting a cough assist, uh, are you getting the volumes back? But in in that, are the there is the therapy actually getting good pulmonary toileting? One of the biggest issues that I would say with cough assist, and whether you're invasive. Or, especially invasive trach patient or if you're non-invasive, is that non-invasively, the synchrony with the volume and getting the breath in and out, it seems to falter a lot with the T70 or the traditional caucuses. It's, it's the best that's been around, but, uh, but that being said, you know, it, it, it's not optimal, I guess you would say, in regards to patients breathing in and out with the mask, especially if they can't hold it to their face. Um, and then secondly, with invasive patients that you do increase the risk of infection because you're switching back and forth, you're switching um, circuits, going from the T7 to is breaking that circuit, going back to your ventilator, catching your breath and all these things. Now, what I will say is that there is a device out there known as the Voxin. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, but it's, it stands for a ventilator, oxygen, concentrator, suction machine, nebulizer. And the, 
the biggest advantage that that machine has, especially with arterial muscular patients, is that it provides breath sync technology on the ventilator with the cough assist. And what that does is that that allows for the ventilator to give you breaths while you're getting your cough assist therapy. And that goes a long way with pulmonary toileting and getting those secretions out and keeping the airway clean. So I would say, especially, especially if you're invasive, to look into, uh, I use my cough so much. Uh, yeah, if you're, if you're using the, if you're using a cough assist on the trach, you, I would say you definitely want to try to use the auto mode and have the, and have the, the auto uh, feature and have the actual providers titrate it and adjust it based on your breathing to where it's most comfortable in, at, at the home. Uh, and you, you even may want to try that in different positions. Everyone is not comfortable doing the cough assist sitting up. Some people may be leaning back at certain angles, so forth and so on. Uh, but if, if, you are, if you have a ventilator and the cough assist and you're trait, I would suggest the Voxin because I, I, would, I would just suggest that device because it, it just has done really well with pulmonary toileting. It's like it's really not, it's, it's just really good at that. And so, um, but aside from that, the T70 is effective, but you just have to be a little bit more, a little bit more um, uh, precise in the application of it. So. Yeah. Good. Uh, Sonia has a comment. Um, she said, it's my understanding that my pal's trilogy is addressing his respiratory failure and his sleep apnea. He is bedridden and is primarily peg fed. Okay. I guess, yeah. It's, is that correct? Is that accurate? Is it the trilogy so, addressing respiratory failure and sleep apnea? Yes, yes, yes. I, so if, if, they're, if they're addressing sleep apnea, then I'm assuming it's in ABAPS mode, right? I'm assuming that. I don't, I don't know, but I'm assuming that. Um, what I would say to that is that the only thing with the, so there's, there's, the, the, there's the trilogy, there's the ResMed Astral, there's the Vivo, 40, Vivo series by Breyes. Um, what I would say to that is that the only thing that I generally am hesitant about with the trilogy, not to say that we don't have trilogy patients, but we have 200, about 250 ventilator patients and only 20 or so are trilogy. So it's not that we don't use Trilogy, but our issue with the Trilogy was and has been the way that it will adjust for those apnea issues or those respiratory insufficiency issues. So what I mean, what do I mean by that? If it takes about eight breaths, five to eight breaths, depending on the setting, it takes, a, you know, let's just say it's five breaths. It takes these amount of breaths for the machine to calculate the volume that is going to give you or the pressure that's going to adjust to to accommodate for your apnea or to accommodate for your respiratory insufficiency. In that amount of time, it would take into account as let's say you cough, it's going to take that as a breath. Let's say you yawn, it's going to take that as a breath. And let's say you give an actual breath, it'll take that as a breath. And it will average out, that's what the A stands for in ABAP, so average volume assisted pressure support. So it will average out those breaths and give you a designated amount of pressure. The problem with that is an average is not, it, A, the average is not accurate, right? Because just because I, I breathe, I, I coughed on this breath and I yawned on this breath, that wasn't, that, that wasn't an actual breath. So it's taking into account misleading information. But two, the amount of time that is taken to calculate the measurement is an issue. Um, where the other devices have updated their technology where it will calculate and it will adjust breath by breath. So you didn't get, you didn't get the volume that you needed that, that breath, it automatically adjusts the next breath, right? Whereas the trilogy is waiting to get an average. So in our experience, we tend to lean away from it. Now, if there is an issue to where the, 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 the doctor just wants that or um, it may be an issue where the, the, the trilogy is the easiest thing to use, then we'll go that route. But yeah, you know, the, the the trilogy is adjusting for those things, but I don't think it's the it, it's the best edit. I'll say that. Now, one more question, and then we need to wrap it up. But um, let's see, you have an office in Austin, and that's you no know, y'all are based out of Dallas, right? No office oh, in Austin. Yeah. Okay, and um, then. Uh, 
Let's see, she says, um, is it best to go to the neurologist regarding breathing issues prior to the pulmonologist and, pulmonologist and respiratory therapist? She just wants the most um, efficient and effective route so she can get her mom's respiratory issues addressed. So would you recommend them going to the neurologist first or go straight to the pulmonologist? No, no, I, I would go to the neurologist first, but not, I wouldn't delay it at a, you know, I wouldn't push it off to go to the neurologist if you can get to a pulmonologist within a more reasonable time, right? And so, what you know, I would wait to go to a neurologist and so that the pulmonologist can have information to make a decision about your respiratory treatment. But there are some clinics where it takes six months. To right? so you don't want to wait six months to address your breathing um, just to wait for the neurologist first. So even in that, you have to really look at your scenario and make the a call based on what information you're given and what's available to you. If ideally, if you can go to the neurologist first, go to the neurologist first. But if not, don't delay it to the detriment and not and not see your pulmonologist within a reasonable amount of time. Great, awesome. Well, thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Toya. We appreciate you guys appreciate uh, you joining us today and presenting for us. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, if you've got questions and just a quick note, I messed up Daniel's phone number in the chat. So I think somebody put the correct one after that. So just make that note. I messed up on his phone number. So, but uh, we'll, we'll also include uh, their contact information in our follow-up email with the recording of this uh, presentation. And so if you want to connect with them at any point, you'll have that information available to you. So thank you again for joining us today. And we appreciate you guys for participating and uh, thank you again, Daniel and Toya. My thank pleasure. You. Thank you guys. Have a good day.